we are not all the same when we are called. We are people who are, if you've ever taken a Myers-Briggs personality test, and I'm going to give you some things that you can do online to realize your leadership style and your spiritual gifts we'll talk about too today. If you're somebody who likes to talk, which I am somebody like that, you might score this Myers-Briggs, what they call an E. If you're somebody who doesn't like to talk as much, you might score an I. But my friends, both E's and I's are called. Sometimes there's a mistake made in the church where everybody has to be, oh, if you're going to be a preacher, you must be somebody who always likes to talk and have attention and all those types of things. Some of the best pastors I've had in my life were more intuitive people. Also, as we look around at each other, we realize that we're not all the same age. We're not all in the same place. We weren't all brought up in the church. We're not all the same gender. If you look in your group, some of you are boys, some of you are girls. Some of you have played a girl part. We all have diversity within uh, the, our groups. And I love the, how Kathy pointed out those scriptures. I'm not going to look those scriptures up because she's already done that. But one of my favorite call stories is the call story that I don't think we always point out, and that's the call story of Mary. Bishop Desmond Tutu once said that he thought that was the greatest call story of all time. Even when she had those questions... Notice how in that story, it's different than the Moses call story. What did you do as Moses? He kind of stuttered. Kind of, he, even at some point, why would you send me? I can't talk. All those different things. Mary, she asked her questions, and then what does she say? Here I am. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me as it is bad. I just speak to the, the women in the group, and I think I, I feel I really need to say this today. Don't let anybody ever tell you you are not called because you're not a man. The God-bearer, what we call in Greek, Theotokos, was a woman. The first evangelist, what's it mean to be an evangelist? To preach the good news that who is risen? Easy answer. Christ. The first ones to believe that were the women at the empty tomb. Remember you guys were upstairs. <coughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> and they went out and preached. They were the first evangelists. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you were not called because you were a woman. Don't let anybody ever tell you that. Because you are called. And there are plenty of evidence, not just in Scripture, but throughout history. Because we are diverse. We are men, we are women, we are young, we are old. In this group, we're all probably first career. I came to my calling, a little bit of my call of story, first career, right out of, I went to college. I didn't think I was going to be a pastor. I thought I was going to be a lawyer. And then I went and realized in my junior, senior year, I was really struggling. I had remembered when I was at an event. How many of you were at? The big youth event last year it was out in, um, oh, I just lost it. Yeah, it was out in Indiana or Sacramento, that's right. I was at that one in 1991 when it was in Missouri as a ninth grader. And I remember going forward, and I couldn't figure out why I was going forward other than something was pushing me forward. I didn't know what it meant, but I remember going forward when they asked, do you feel like you might be called to something else than just... Understand me, we're all called. We're all what they call priesthood of believers. But are you called to something even more, some type of special ministry within the church? And that's why you're all here to explore that. Some of you might find your call to that uh, ordained ministry or a, a, some type of specialized lay ministry. You'll hear more about that later. And some of you might not find that out. That's not your calling. But we all are called. We are all a priesthood of believers. And we're all diverse within that calling. We're all diverse. On your worksheet, there's a, a list there, some questions. We're not going to take too much time on this because there's several things I want to talk about. But it says, my desires and God's will. And as you work out your calling, these are some great questions that I found that I think can really help you with that. Kathy, what an excellent call story. She's one of the best pastors I know in our conference. And she laid it out so well that we all hear it in different ways. And we all have different things that probably we could also do. But know, too, that when you have those other things, do those gifts also match what would help us in the church? And know that not all of us come to it in the same way. We do not all come to it in the same way. <coughs> Mary, when she was called, did not come to it in the same way. So those questions there are, what do you really want? What are the deepest desires of your heart? Spend time in prayer about that as you're searching out your call. What do you think or feel God wants of you? How are they the same or different? And sometimes that happens. Um, I'm pretty sure Jeremiah, when we read his call story, that was another one I was lifted up, was not too thrilled about the uprooting and the tearing down. And boy, if you read the book of Jeremiah, it is not all roses uh, for him at all. Uh, I'm preaching on Jeremiah later this month. 
and what he has to go to, he even goes down to the potter's house, and there's clay, and all of a sudden it's like, now it's smashed out, I can't work with it anymore, God says. Oh my goodness, is he, go, is he called to help anybody out, you know, at some point? And, you know, so sometimes our desires are not the same, but we still have this longing to do something in the diversity of who we are. In what ways are you fulfilling your desires and God's will? In what ways are you blocked from doing so? Sometimes there are people, I, I lifted one up, sometimes people will say, well, you're not a man, you're not called. It, that's a block, but it's not necessarily from God. In fact, I know that one's not from God. So don't ever let, that's just an example, that's an extreme example. An extreme example that I thought was dead, but I come to find out every once in a while in my naivety that it's not dead. Sorry about that, I thought we lived in 2012. But sometimes we don't always. And so don't let that, don't let people block you when it is not a legitimate block. Now, sometimes there are legitimate blocks and people that will tell you, hey, hold on, you need to discern this, maybe this isn't the right call, and there are people that will guide you in that. And ask that question, in what ways you're blocked from doing so, which ones are legitimate and which ones might not be? And who can you seek guidance and discernment on those things? All right, well, we all have leadership styles. And we all are diverse and we all come to hearing God's call in a different way. I want to spend a couple minutes on hearing the call, leadership, and then diversity of gifts. First on hearing the call. Some of us, I think, hear the call and it's sudden, and it's it's like, bang! You know, it's kind of like coming to Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed there are some people that, when they come to Jesus Christ, they have this story, and it's all painted out, and it's like this almost like deathbed confession, right? And it's like this dramatic thing, and it's, it's just wonderful. And, I always love to hear those stories, and I always say to God, I don't have that story. I grew up in the church. I was baptized in the United Methodist Church. I came to know Christ through my Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and through moments with God at camps and youth conferences and stuff. I just don't have that bang moment. And God, throughout my life, I've heard God say, that's okay. Because not everybody comes to Christ through that. Right like that, you know. And I think it's the same with our calls. I have moments and snapshots but where I could feel the Holy Spirit saying, this is how you're called and, and guide me. But I can't say definitively there was ever one moment that I was like, that's it. I definitely know from that moment I'm called to be a pastor. Mine was more of a process from that ninth grade moment. My goodness, all the way back when I was in um, sixth, seventh grade and I had a youth leader say, I envision you in the pulpit someday, to which I laughed. And then I think he had a final laugh, but whatever the case was, to a Sunday school teacher who said, you asked really good questions, Ron. Those are snapshots of God working through people to bring me and to bring me to where I'm at. So for some of you, it's, I know it, this is that moment, and I know I'm called to this, and now I need to work on those things and follow the desires, what that sheet says. And for others of you, it's snapshots, it's gradual. Know that God works in all those ways. And scripture bears that out in people's testimonies. We're, we're Wesleyans, we're Methodists. Experiences is part of how we come to know God too. And our experiences bear that out. Other people's experiences bear that out. So some of us it's like that. Some of us it's a gradual process. I think it's also the same way we come to confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Yeah, there are moments, there are snapshots. Maybe it's a confirmation moment. Maybe it's something later in life. Maybe it's something earlier in life. But some of us have more of that, and some of us have more of that gradual path. Some of us have that path where we were in it, we turned away from it, and then we come back. You'll hear that in Paul's stories, too. <laughs> I was supposed to go this way, I didn't go this way, now I'm going to go the right way to God. <coughs> those are all, and how we're all called differently in those things. It's, it's a beautiful thing. All right. So, we have mingled, we have seen the diversity. Does anybody have any questions on the fact that we are all called and in different ways? I think that's pretty obvious that we all have that. So we've done that. Now I want to hand out something that deals with different leadership styles. Sometimes the church has made the mistake in the past. I'm going to use you two again. You're like mine. <laughs> Sometimes the church has made the mistake in the past of not recognizing that just because you're not like me, that doesn't mean you're not called to be a pastor, or not called to be a chaplain, or not called to be a youth minister, or a music leader, or a deacon, or any of those other things, or a certified lay minister, or whatever the case. That we all have differences in our leadership style. I came across this, and this one um, divides it up into four categories. The thinker, the director, the pleaser, and the dreamer. 
And then on the back, it, it talks about how you could be in harmonization with different people who have different leadership styles. When you're leading in the church, you're going to come across people that have different styles than you. And it's good for us to know what our style <coughs> is and to grow in that and not to necessarily be stuck in those styles, but to also recognize that others will have a different way of leading. And one of the things that, if you are a leader in the church, that I think is a powerful thing is to be able to encourage others in their leadership, to empower them. If you're the one that's always doing all the work is, and doing everything, then I don't think you're a really good leader, actually. You're in, you need to recognize your leadership style and empower others in their leadership style. So what I want you to do is look through these different ones and possibly circle one. Now know that just like life, Nothing is ever concrete. So you might be like, well, I could be a thinker and a dreamer, or, you know, a combination of those things. And know that these aren't the only categories out there. There's nothing like that. But look throughout these different things and these leadership and interaction styles, and maybe pick one or two that you think describes you the most. Kind of look over there. You've got the thinker who's um, deliberate and logical and likes facts and figures and, and likes to make decisions on different things is highly organized. You have the director, who's very task-oriented. I remember one time, um, I might still a story, I heard about the bishop, actually. I might get in trouble for this. It was, it was about planning a, a trip, and there was all kinds of dreamers in, in, the, in the trip, and, and nothing was getting done, because everybody was just dreaming and visioning, and they brought in Tom Salesgiver, who is a director, if you've ever met him. And he was he's task-oriented and whatever. When they brought in the director, then plans got laid down. But they had to have the dreams in order to have the director who planned. So one of the neat things is, is if you're a director, you might not be the person who always has those big vision goals. You might get those. But you might be the person who's like, I can get this done. Give me a, are you a, a checklist person? You know, you write this down and get those things done. Uh, there's also the pleaser who, who loves to help out, who, who likes the, the relationships and is very sensitive, maybe um, empathetic to different people, and is really good at that. And then also the dreamer, uh, focused on the big picture. The details, hey, they'll work their way out. <coughs> but, um, we want to get the big picture and the idea and all those different things. So look through those. Those are some uh, overviews of those. And know that different leadership styles exist in the church. And just because it, it's not that all pastors or all lay leaders should be dreamers. If they were all dreamers, guess what? Probably nothing would get done because nobody would do the tasks or work the list. And it's not that they should be all directors because if we're all directors, then who's going to, who, like the prophet Joel said, who are going to be the young men and the young women that dream dreams and have visions and do those things and tell us the next direction of the Lord? Who's going to be intuitive to the Holy Spirit for that? Not that the Holy Spirit's not with all that. All right, so you got that. Now you're going to mingle a little bit and turn to four people. Get in groups of four and kind of look through those things and share real quick within your group which one you think you're more like or which two you think you're more like. Now, just to notice, in your group, are there people that have different leadership styles? Know that they're all valid. I think one of the beauties of being the church is that we affirm that people have different styles. So people have different backgrounds, ethnicities, people are different genders, people have different leadership styles, people have different experiences of coming to Christ, coming to hear the call of Christ. They are all equally valid, especially in the United Methodist Church. We are just a people of grace. If you don't know anything about the faith that you are in the United Methodist Church, you know we are people of grace that affirm that people are different and come to God from different areas. Just if I can tell you one thing, you know we are people of grace that affirm that. And you are affirmed in that. One other thing is to talk about then gifts. So we have different leadership styles, we have different ways of hearing God's call, and then we also have different gifts. And the handout that you just got is a listing of the scriptures that talk about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are things that come from God. They are gifts that were given to you by God. How many of you, oh, excuse me, how many of you have ever taken a spiritual gifts inventory? I'm going to give you one today, and I'm going to give you a listing of ones you can find online. One of the best ones I found online, and I am heavily United Methodist, but one of the best ones I found online was from the Lutherans. So <laughs> we're all God's <laughs> <laughs> and I And there's a website for that. Um, and it, it 
it's great because it gives a little bit more diversity in answering the questions, and it's a click down one, and it, it lets you click on the answer, and then it gives you the answers. I, the bishop said I have a couple more. Kathy took a couple minutes for me. <laughs> right? I'm still I okay. did. I did. She got, I, I asked for special dispensation. <laughs> I'm almost <laughs> So these are scriptures, and I'm going to, since my time is short, I'm going to give you that as the bishop comes up, we'll hand out the spiritual gift inventories, listings of what the spiritual gifts are, and then I gave you an inventory that you can take over lunch or any time today. It's got like 150 questions. You can score it, and then you can look at different spiritual gifts. But there are ones that are listed there. Do you see them? Anybody want to, just so we can hear them, someone read the seven that are listed under the Romans passage. Someone read those. We don't have time to read the scripture, but someone just go ahead and read those seven. Prophecy, servanthood, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, compassion. Okay, so those are a list there. Usually the lists vary from about 20 to 25 gifts. Scripturally speaking, there's 20 that are definite there. All right, from the first Corinthians one, it goes from 8 to 15. Go ahead, yes. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, discernment, tongues, interpretation of tongues. And then the three under the first Corinthians 12. I see someone's hand up in the middle. Go ahead, Roger. Um, apostleship, helping and assistance, and then administration. And then uh, the Ephesians 4 one. Presentation. Okay. Evangelism and shepherding. Okay. Yeah, we are different people, different backgrounds, different ways that we've come to Christ. We have different leadership styles, and we need to recognize that and work with others who have different leadership styles than us. And if we are leaders, whether we're ordained or specialized as lay uh, people called a part or set apart for specialized ministry, whatever the case is, we need to empower other people because everybody here is called by God and a priesthood of believers. And then we have different spiritual gifts. And I encourage you to get things from God. These are things God gave you. I encourage you to find out what maybe those are and how you can use them to further the ministry of Jesus Christ in your life. All right, one last story. I think I'm out of done in one minute. <laughs> one last story. I was called and set apart to be an ordained elder. And that's just one possibility. But if you are called to that or called to some type of specialized ministry, know that one of the most powerful things you can do is to be with people in their God moments. To use your leadership style and your diversity of gifts, your spiritual gifts, to be with people in their God moments. My, one of my favorite God moments is confirmation, where I get to be with people, learning about their faith, exploring it, asking questions. We do a year-long process at my church. And then on Confirmation Sunday, whether these 12, 13, 14, 15, 16-year-olds know, I get to say, whether you know it or not, whether the world has told you or not, whether your teachers have told you, whether your parents have told you, no matter what, let us as a church, and me as a representative of the Church of Jesus Christ in the United Methodist faith, tell you that you are loved by God, that I affirm that you are a child of God, that the Holy Spirit is in your life. And it's such a holy and powerful moment. And no matter who you are, you are loved by this God who has come down in human form to be with us. And He's given us gifts. And you are called to be in this church and to share God's love. And to most importantly at that moment, know you are loved by God no matter what. I encourage you all to find that place where you get to tell other people that they are loved by God no matter what, and to affirm it. If you're an ordained elder or deacon, you might get to lay hands on people and look at them and say, you are a child of God, and in the name of God, we claim that you are loved for who you are, no matter what, and are loved by this church. And you can find that in the diversity of your gifts, in the diversity of who you are, that you get a chance to know where you will be called. For me, it's to do that, and there's other places that Kathy listed. For you, it might be to do that. And if it is, I'm so excited for you. It's just one of the best things. It's, I can't imagine doing anything else because I get to tell people they're loved by God. How much better does it get? I get to affirm their <laughs> gifts and empower them. It doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, there's the crap too. I'm not going to sugar that's <laughs> Kathy laid that out, yeah. <laughs> but we all have to do paperwork. So don't even think if you're getting into this ministry, there's no paperwork. There's paperwork. These wonderful things called end of the year reports is one of them. Amen. Don't do them, your superintendent will be on. That's beside the point. But besides that, 
Yes, I get to do that. I did that. But I get to tell people that are loved by God, affirm that, and empower them to serve Jesus Christ, and call them to be a disciple. I encourage you to find where you'll be called. Youth ministry, college ministry, chaplain, wherever your gifts or leadership style leads you, pastor, specialized lay minister, faculty, or whatever, I encourage you to find that. Because there is there's nothing better if you are called to that. If you're not called to that, you know, then do it wherever you're called to. But if you're called to that, then I encourage you to accept that challenge and to do that for God.